It's providing value and therefore we want to keep it. So we work on it. Hello and welcome to Architecture Corner. Uh, I'm with Woody Sud and we're going to talk about legacy software. You said something just before we started recording, uh, Woody, uh, about the word legacy itself. Yeah, so I think of legacy software as being software that we have inherited either from ourselves or from someone who's worked on it before us. It's providing value and therefore we want to keep it, so we work on it. So, so it's, it's, it's like an inheritance, right? It's like an inheritance. Yes, yeah, a negative term, like, oh, this old crap. But it can't be crap if it's been running successfully for 50 years or more. Yeah, I agree. If we still want to use it, if it still is bringing us value, that's why we work on it. That's why we improve it. That's why we add new features to it. That's a good project. We wouldn't have it if it wasn't bringing us value. Mm. The sunk cost, it's, it's not relevant uh, when you evaluate what you, to, what you should do in the future. Yes. So I have the legacy software and I can do a little bit of work on that and I can get this additional value. Or yes. I, can, I can scrap my legacy software, start from scratch and redo the entire $1 billion investment that is already in the legacy software. Yes, and that's, there's a trick to this too. And that is that much of the knowledge is hidden in that existing software we could not go back and rewrite the requirements for it easily. Mm -hmm. It's hard to discover why some of those things are there if they're working for us. The, sys the software is the specification. Yes, the existing system in place, the existing software in place is the specification. That makes it very difficult sometimes to replace an existing system. So it can be a very powerful thing just to keep an existing system running and to make it easier to work on, to make it easier to enhance to make it easier to get rid of the parts that are no longer being used. Because mm -hmm. supporting the parts that are useful is clouded or made more difficult by having to support parts that nobody are using, that nobody's using anymore. So w one thing that I, I noticed with legacy software is it, it, it's a bit like an onion, that someone wrote a core in the 60s, very sleek, maybe an assembler, a mainframe assembler, COBOL, whatever. Then um, they died or s something similar or got hit by a bus or just left the company or got retired and uh, no one dared touch the thing because it was already perfect. So yes. you added some layer on it, call it an API for instance, put some logic in there and then, then you added some other layer because those people were no longer there and so on. And, and, and the onion is growing and growing and growing and eventually uh, it starts rotting in the middle. And, uh, but but the, 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 the thing that makes it so expensive to maintain isn't that you have so much more functionality but that you have grown it in this onion fashion so ah. so you have the whole perimeter of the onion so the perimeter is is the most recently yeah, written it, stuff and as it gets into the core we have less knowledge less understanding mm -hmm. it's less stable now because the environment uh, that supports it may lo no longer be there. Mm -hmm. In other words, we've had to port it to newer machines yes. and, we, and so on and so on. Right. So, uh, and the understanding of why we did it that way was based on things that are no longer constraints for us, mm -hmm. the constraints of 30 years ago. Now, I don't know if I've ever worked on a project that was 30 years old, but I've worked on projects that were 15 years old. And yes, uh, and it, even that is already uh, old. Yeah, and that can be quite old. Ways. And often then we come to the idea of let's rewrite it. Mm -hmm. And rewriting it can be a useful thing, but also merely learning how to refactor it into a currently good state is useful as well. Sometimes that's the better path. To get the, the level of, of confidence in your knowledge about the, there's this term, uh, software spelunking. Oh, I like that. Where you uh, use different techniques to really understand what every part of the software is yes. doing. Yes. That reminds me of something we used to do, which we call forensics. So we do software forensics. We would, we, would use, we would get the existing code that we don't understand and then just start uh, deleting, so to speak, the references to the dependencies it has. Mm -hmm. So we could discover what does it need from those dependencies. It's sort of just a way to force us to look at, well, what is this thing operating with, in conjunction with? Yeah, I, I guess that could be a spelunking technique. Kind of like a spelunking to, technique. Uh, one of yeah. many spelunking. Yeah. 
techniques. Um, so uh, a, um, a, any um, you can't start with the full onion, right? Right. Yeah, uh, every onion starts from a seed. Yeah. So if we if we uh, think of John Gall's uh, ideas, these laws about uh, systems, and one of them is that a, a working complex system invariably uh, evolved from a working simple system. Mm -hmm. That we can't contrive a complex system. That we have to have a simple system for it to have grown from. Now, whether that's true or not, of course, is open for debate. But in my experience, shows that's kind of true. Uh, another thing that he states is that most simple systems don't work. So you can't simply take a simple system and evolve it into a working complex system. We have to be very observant to find working simple systems. This is the idea of evolving software. If we, if we take a, an architecture and evolve it from working code, uh, working software, mm -hmm. we would probably be able to come up with a better working architecture than so if we designed it, it, it from start. An emergent So I, I had some colleagues who did research uh, on uh, design work, and they what they found was that l let's say we we have on a high level we have concept ideas things we want to do. Let's say it's a nuclear power plant, and we wanted to have a certain output uh, in terawatts or uh, petawatts or whatever. And on on the most practical level, we have nuts and bolts, and we have steam running around and radioactive particles going right. around and doing their stuff. And it, it, it doesn't matter if we want to have a petawatt uh, a nuclear power plant if we don't have the pipe yes. that supports that kind of steam. Okay, so if we bring that into the concept of a simple system, we can simplify it a great deal. There are certain simple laws, physical laws, about the things that can be involved in that nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. And if we understand those well, then we can probably build on those thinking. Now, I wouldn't have it in me to even consider what goes into a nuclear power plant. No. But if we take something very simple, let's just say water delivery to a building like this. How complex of a system is that? It's based on extremely simple ideas. Mm -hmm. Gravity, water seeking its own level, uh, pressure, things about water pressure going through tubes and mm -hmm. pipes and so on. Mm -hmm. These are all simple, well-known things. Yes. We can start from the simplest concept, and we don't need to go very far to get a complex system that will deliver water throughout this building. But, an even better example is, is ventilation. 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 Everyone's been in an office or, or a, a, a meeting room that is not well ventilated. Yes. Uh, and despite this being a very simple process of just the gas flowing through pipes, in, out, etc. And, and, uh, and, and usually it takes a year to fine tune the ventilation, oh. even though it's, it's perfectly designed from the beginning. And so going back to, to, to the power plant, and, and so what my colleagues found was that any successful design uh, process uh, goes up and down between the different levels. Oh. You can't, you can't work kind of from what you want to specifying it a bit, little bit more and a bit more and a bit more. Yes. Because in the end, if the, the, if the screw that you need doesn't exist, then you can't build it. Right. So you, so you still need to have this. So this is not only about a simple system then uh, that's working. It's it, about the, the simple parts of a large system as well. So I would say, like in software, a lot of what we do is based on some very simple concepts. They become very complex when we try to solve modern uh, problems, such as security issues or mm -hmm. um, performance issues and things like that. But going back to, to the legacy software, that yeah. is the result, the emergent result of a very long process where you have wanted to do things and you've been able to do things yes. and finding a compromise between those yes. for, for, for many, many, many years. So that kind of, uh, I believe, leads us to this concept that we need to be paying attention to simplicity. So this is, comes out of the Agile Manifesto, but probably from a lot of other things as well. We need to be paying attention to simplicity. As soon as we have more than we need, then we are adding a burden to that legacy system. So a good case in point would be, uh, I've worked on systems where we wrote features that nobody essentially ever used. Mm -hmm. Out of the 30 or 40 features, let's say, that was in a product, there were five or six that were getting continuous use. Mm -hmm. But every time you want to improve those features or add a new feature, you have to consider whether you're breaking one of those features on somebody may never use. You know, what, what I always want to do in software is to add 
uh, statistics, so I can see yes. who uses what yes, feature, right. and and if there is a change, for instance, for for a feature that I know no one is using, and I can say yes, but you're not even using it now. Yes. Why do you want it changed? So this type of analytics is important to have. It's easier yeah. in in websites because yeah. there are all these available uh, out outside, but if you have an in-company system, you have to remember to do it yourself. Yeah, you can roll it yourself, but most of the calls that are being made across your network are going to be able to be you know, uh, mined for information as well. You can also mine your, your source control system. So if you have areas that are often changed together, mm -hmm. that means there's some kind of a dependency or cohesiveness, one or the other or both, amongst those parts. So you can start looking at the parts that need to get changed as your product is evolving over time and the parts nobody cares about because you never need to do anything with them. Now you can say those are the parts that are rock solid, but that's not necessarily true. It, I think that most parts of your system would be changed once in a while at least if somebody was using them. You're right, you're right. Uh, on an enterprise level, uh, one very common way to get legacy software uh, and, and now maybe it's really legacy because it's mergers and acquisitions. Oh yes. So, yes. so someone buys uh, a company and uh, along with it comes its own DNA in the forms of software. Right. And, and um, now suddenly you have two and right. three and four and eight and 10 and 15 systems doing exactly the same thing. Yes. Yeah, that's a tricky area. In a, almost the same way. Yeah, and, and if you want to try and use these systems at the same time, for example, th that one division or whatever is going to keep using the old one, but you want to, you want it to be somehow communicating with your existing system. So you now have two systems that need to communicate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You need to have an adapter of some sort between them. So so comes the integration bus, comes yes. the orchestration, comes people filling in the gaps where the automation is failing. That's right, because this and this system may have a need for data that this system can't provide, and vice versa. Where's that data going to come from? How are we going to pretend that it's there? Mm -hmm. and, are, and the onion keeps growing. And the onion keeps growing. So that, that's a good time where the refactoring and simplifying really pays off. Because now we can start saying, what are the essential parts of this system? What are the essential parts of this system? Are they really that different? Sometimes it's just the essential things that we need to be interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe some companies uh, or, or the, the decisions about mer mergers and acquisitions are often taken on a very high level where, where the uh, simple software is, is not even visible. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's probably the right place for that. The thinking about the software has to be done whether you're, whether you're gathering these companies together or not. Every line of code we add to our existing code base adds complexity. Hmm. Every feature we add adds complexity. Do we need that whole feature? Do we need all of these features? If we keep things simple, if we had two very simple systems in this software, we could more easily see how can we combine them or how can we move this info from one system to another or get rid of the other system? How do we migrate the data so it's useful in both systems? I worked with a company that had a, the opposite approach. They had a, a, let's call it a legacy system. They had evolved since, since early 1980s that worked perfectly for, for their business process. And they would buy other companies and, and not take over their software. Sure. Just their, their stock of, of um, customers and so on. Their, their, uh, and put them in their own so system mm -hmm. because theirs was the best on the market. So they were able to make uh, a profit, right. a better profit from, from doing the same thing as, as the previous company had done. Yes, yeah, so throwing away that existing system that was serving the acquired company hmm. could be the best step. Obviously, that could be just as good as anything else. Matter of fact, a lot of the the idea of what made that other company worth worth acquiring hmm. may have nothing to do with how well they're doing with certain things. It could be more to do with some kind of an image, or it could be with certain product that they have. It could be products, access yeah. to customers, uh, individuals, geographical access, yeah. individuals. Yeah. But those are hard to buy, maybe easier to recruit. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I can't solve that problem. Yeah, <laughs> there's too many problems to solve. But I, I think if we go back just to the idea of legacy code, if we are simply working with a single system, making it easier and easier to work on is worthwhile because the life of that product or the life of that piece of software can extend for a very long period of time if we take good care of it. <laughs> 
Thank you. And I, I think on those words, uh, we'll end this episode. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. <laughs>